Good morning, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another online edition of our Family Bible Hour. We're glad you could be here or be at your homes, I guess, for the time being. Um, our speaker today is going to be Sean McNeil. Um, he's, uh, Sean's an elder here at Bethel. I'm sure most of you would know him. Uh, he's going to be continuing our series on the miracle working Messiah. Uh, but before Sean comes on, I've got a few announcements, and then we'll pray, and then we'll turn it over to Sean. So if you didn't know, this year marks Camp ABK's 60th anniversary, so that's 60 years of, of God's blessing. And uh, while this year looks pretty different from, I'd venture to say, almost every other year in camp's existence, except maybe the first, um, we know the Lord's still blessing the work at camp, and this summer is being used to uh, complete a great deal of, of maintenance work and other projects, so uh, just please continue to pray for camp. Uh, our weekly prayer meeting, Wednesday at 7 p.m. here at the chapel. Uh, no RSVP is necessary. And again, our Lord's Supper will meet for the third time since we had suspended. Uh, this Sunday at 9.30 coming up, uh, please contact Pat Bushy by Thursday at noon if you'd like to attend. And a reminder for all the ladies of the Zoom baby shower for Florence Avery. Uh, that'll be this Thursday, July the 16th at 7 p.m., uh, if you're uncomfortable on the Zoom platform, please consider joining along with someone who is. If you'd like to contribute to a group gift, uh, you can please give to Leah Farron, either at her home via an e-transfer, or you can bring to Bethel between 1 and 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoons. Just please make sure it's clearly marked as the group gift. Uh, wrapped gifts can also be brought to Leah's home or to Bethel at that time. And uh, Please remember, if you want to participate, to send baby pictures of yourself to Sarah as soon as you can for a special game that she's planning. Um, the link to the Zoom shower will be sent out ahead of time. All you need to do on Thursday is relax in front of your computer or device, along with a cupcake or a treat and a fancy beverage, and be ready for a time of fun. So let's make sure you all participate and encourage the Avery family. Uh, for more information on that, there are posters at the chapel if you're here, or you can find them on our Facebook page, or you can contact Sarah McNeil. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this opportunity that we have uh, to still participate in our Family Bible Hour services, even though it's, it still may seem a little strange and a little, um, a little different. Uh, we're just grateful that we have this, this technology to do so and that we can share and uh, that we have people willing to, to work behind the scenes and putting this all together. And, and uh, thank you for the time that Sean has put into his message today and that we'll get to still benefit from, from hearing your word spoken. I pray for those of us that are um, maybe not feeling well or dealing with other issues. We think of um, you know, people that may have financial issues or, or relationship issues, that you would just bless them in this time and um, just help us still continue to show your love to our friends and family and, and co-workers, even though we may be uh, six feet apart from each other, that we would still continue to be a light uh, that shines for you, for Jesus. Thank you for this chapel and uh, the provisions you've given to us and how you continue to bless it. Um, I pray for Camp ABK, as uh, this summer looks a little different, as I said earlier, but uh, we know that your work is still being done there, and this is a summer that they can take advantage of, of getting a lot of work done, a lot of maintenance done, and uh, be ready for the next camp session that we have. Uh, I think of other children's ministries that, uh, you know, right now it's usually not something that's hot in our minds in the middle of summer, but, um, you know, we're in the middle of July, and August I'm sure will go by quickly, and we'll be back into September, and uh, right now, I'm not sure what the, the future holds for those, but I pray for um, all the volunteers that have to make decisions, um, all the, the ministry leads, and then all the children, too, that I uh, think of kids that this summer won't get to go to ABK that they normally get to go to, and uh, for kids tuning in for Awana in September or BRC or youth group, that um, you would just bless them and comfort them through all of this, and uh, we know, Lord, that you are in control, so we just pray that your will be done in all of this and in all of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So thanks again for tuning in. I will turn it over to Sean now, who's going to be speaking on Mark chapter 5. Good morning, Bethel, and uh, welcome again to another Family Bible Hour uh, via our YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us this morning, and thank you, Dave, for that good opening. Let's pray together. Fathers, we look into the book of Mark today, chapter 5, and look at this miracle about this uh, man who was possessed with all sorts of demons, who, has, who meets Jesus and is healed, would you guide us through this miracle that we would understand it clearly, we would get the, the main points, and we would ultimately then be able to apply it into our lives in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you, Father, for your word and that we've been able to continue to be faithful to proclaim it week by week during this time of, um, of pandemic. And we ask once again, Father, through this method and in this way, 
that you would uh, bless each of us as we listen individually in our homes, maybe with our families and small groups, and that uh, it would be uh, a benefit and edification to each that listen. Thank you, Father, for your word, that you guide us by your spirit to understand it, and we thank you for its truth, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of Mark, chapter 5, and Mark is um, one of the shortest of the Gospels, and one thing that I've always come to appreciate about the book of Mark is I've looked into it a little bit, and one miracle that is also recorded in Matthew and Luke is that Matthew, Mark presents to us a very vivid, forceful, and descriptive writing uh, style that des uh, uh, describes and, uh, and reflects an eyewitness account. And he also emphasizes Jesus' teaching, um, or his actions, sorry, more than his teaching. So he presents to us um, with unusual candor and the people he, uh, he speaks about. And we'll see this in this uh, miracle this, this week as it covers... 20 verses of chapter 5, really half of, the, half of the chapter. So let's read this together. They came to the other side of the sea, that is the Sea of Galilee, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him, one out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had been often bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had strength to subdue him. Night and day in the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And, he saw Jesus come, and when he saw Jesus coming from afar, he ran and fell down at his feet. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying, that is Jesus, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out, of the, out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. What a sight. The herdsmen fled and told it to the city and in the country, and the people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, one who had the legion, sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it had seen it, described it to them, what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat to leave, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go to your home and to your friends, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has showed mercy to you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. What an amazing story that we will explore in detail this morning from the book of Mark. A few weeks ago when we looked at the miracle of the man with the withered hand, I presented a definition that I thought we would uh, circle back to it by way of um, review this morning. And this definition uh, says this, a miracle has been designed, defined sorry, as a work wrought by divine power, for divine purpose, by means beyond the reach of man. We've also discovered, as Randy spoke to us, that one clear purpose of miracles was to authenticate the character of Jesus and his relationship with his heavenly Father. A second purpose also was to authenticate the message of Jesus, the message that he brought, that it was out of this world. It was not natural. It was supernatural. And it was life-changing and life-impacting. This miracle that we're going to look at today and we've just read, to me as I studied it, um, was evident that it is one of a cosmic confrontation. And that's what I've entitled this sermon for this week. A cosmic confrontation that resulted in a number of, number of reactions and responses 
and ultimately at the end of the story in verse 20 resulted in an evangelistic outreach as this man went back to the Decapolis, these 10 cities in the region of Gadara or in the Gerasene countryside. And we'll see that Jesus in chapter 8 of Mark returns to this area and I wonder what he would find after this man being miraculously uh, uh, healed from these demons would have told the area. And we could look at that another time. So as we move forward, I have a big idea for you that you can kind of have in the back of your mind as we go through this miracle this morning. And it's this. How do you respond to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ? Or how have you responded to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ? For really, there's only two ways that you can respond. To reject it or to accept it. As we explore this miracle, let me read to you from Ephesians to frame uh, your mindset a little further as we move forward this morning. Ephesians chapter 2 says this in the first few verses, And you were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked, following the course of of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom once we, were all, we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Chapter 6, verse 12 reminds us in this section of the whole armor of God about what we battle against in this world. And it says in verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And we'll see in this really interesting miracle just that being worked out for us as Jesus meets up with this demon-possessed man. The setting for this miracle is very, very interesting, and we need to spend just a few minutes this morning digging into this a little bit. From Mark chapter 3, Jesus moved his teaching style to parables. If you remember that that section of of, uh, Mark where uh, Jesus addressed the blasphemy of the Pharisees who said that he was performing these miracles with a spirit of Beelzebub, or a spirit of Satan. And Jesus very clearly uh, counter, counteracted that by saying, how could a house that is divided against itself stand? And so from that point on, and up into where we are now, Jesus begins to teach in parables so that uh, he could um, teach his disciples and mask what he was teaching for that specific, specific purpose. Here we find the, the disciples and Jesus on the other side of Galilee, in Capernaum, and they have had a long, a long number of days back and forth from homes, teaching at the seaside, and Jesus says to his disciples and others, let's go over to the other side. And that's quite interesting, because the other side was Gentile territory, and there were superstitions in the region about what the, the, the Sea of Galilee was like, and that it, uh, it, uh, it consumed those that would sail across it and never gave up its dead, and that the people on the other side, they, they, were, they were not of the same caliber as the ones in the Jewish area of Judea and, uh, and where Jesus was spending his time. So for the, for the context of the people of the time, going across to the other side, except for commerce and work, was somewhat unusual. The Sea of Galilee, we call it a sea, but it's actually a lake. Let's put that in a little bit of perspective as we think about what just happened that evening as they traveled across to the other side, to the countryside of, of the Gerasenes, what they passed through. So this lake, which we would call it, uh, the, the Lake of Galilee, or the Bible, of course, rightly, the Sea of Galilee, is the lowest freshwater lake on the earth. Uh, second only to the Dead Sea, which, of course, is a saltwater lake. It is at some point 700 to 680 feet below sea level. And its length, it's not a big, it's not a big lake. Um, the, the circumference is around 53 kilometers, the, the shoreline. It's 21 kilometers long, and at its widest part, it's 13 kilometers. So it's, it's a significant body of water, um, but one that most of us who are boating enthusiasts or go out in our canoe or, or our pontoon boat 
would not really have a problem navigating. You could likely see very clearly in some parts the other side of the, of the sea. Uh, and at its deepest point, it's only 150 feet deep. So what's the big deal? Well, what we would find if we kind of compare this and put this into perspective for ourselves, Trout Lake is 11 kilometers long, four kilometers thereabouts in some areas wide. Lake Nipissing, quite a bit bigger, is 65 kilometers east to west, and maybe around 25 of its widest point. Um, but one lake that I spent a lot of time at as a kid was Lake Bernard in Sunridge, and it, it, ha it carries the renown of being the largest freshwater lake in North America, I believe, without an island. And it too, being a smaller lake, only seven kilometers long and two and a half kilometers wide, can get very um, stormy, and, can, and can, the waves can go three to four feet depending on the weather. And we had many a time sailing on that lake where we were capsized and we felt a, a little bit uh, out of our element. And so here it is, the disciples with Jesus set out after a busy number of days. I'm sure they were tired and ready for a rest. Now, being seasoned fishermen, they would not head out into a storm knowingly. And they, were, they, know, they knew how to sail. But what happens? They got caught in a storm. And the Sea of Galilee is known uh, for its severe storms because of the wind that whips down from the snow-capped Mount Hermon and then combines with the warm lake water of, of the Sea of Galilee and creates explosive thunderstorms. And you'll see this in the, in the picture that was... Um, displayed on the screen from Rembrandt. It's said that the waves could reach 10 to 12 feet in, the, in these storms, and in some times up to 20 feet. So I think Rembrandt's depiction of these boats that set out from Capernaum uh, heading across the, the sea is very accurate. At the conclusion of this day, we know that the Lord instructed the disciples to set across the sea to the other side, and it takes us to this Im immediately to this miracle of the demon-possessed man. Could you imagine what that must have been like that night? Thrown off their course, uh, taking them many hours, I'm sure, to get back on, on course, crying out to Jesus to save them, and then finally sailing the rest of the night on a placid lake and ending up probably sometime early dawn, uh, maybe still dark, on the eastern shore at precisely the spot that Jesus intended them to go, about six miles around the curve from Capernaum. And when they arrived, the very first thing they see is they step off the, off the waters, we'll soon come to discover in, in, this, in this passage and we read together, is that they see the devastating, destructive power of the forces of evil on this man. In fact, there were two. Matthew, and Matthew refers to two. But we know, as Randy um, mentioned in his blog on the Matthew study, Bible study, that where there are two, there is always one and we don't have any contradiction here. It was likely that, uh, G that Jesus and, and the disciples focused in on the one who, having immediately saw Jesus, ran towards him. So if indeed, if it was late at night or early in the morning, this scene must have been an eerie one. Tired, wet, cold, with their nerves a little bit frazzled from what had happened that night. They were worn thin by this experience of the storm. I found another picture, which is uh, up on the screen now, of another one of these um, pictures of the Sea of Galilee, an actual, an actual picture, and you can see the tempest and the, the ferociousness of this lake. And this is a very close depiction of the boat that they would have sailed across in. They, it was actually called the, the Galilee boat or the Jesus boat. And they, a lot of writers, uh, historical writers, will say that this boat was around 27 feet long, seven, seven and a half feet wide, and with a depth, a preserved height of the hull of around four and a half feet. So it wasn't a big vessel. It could carry 15 people. Five of those would have been crew. So it's accurate from what, we, what we've discovered early in or late in chapter four that a couple of boats went across with the disciples and with Jesus and with some other, others that might have traveled with them. But where were they going? Where are we in this story geographically? Let's take a quick look at this as we continue to build up this uh, this picture in your mind of what is happening with this cosmic confrontation with this man that we will meet very soon. So they traveled across the lake to the country of the Gerasenes, and they came to the other side of the sea to this exact spot. And this was on the southeastern shore, or truly across, directly across the other side. And you can see it from the, the picture that's on the screen as well. 
This was a Gentile area, as tangibly will be demonstrated in a little bit by the presence of the pig herders. And Jesus evidently, as we had already mentioned, spent very little time here during his ministry because the only other place that it is mentioned is later on in Mark in chapter 8. John MacArthur provides some historical background to the different locations mentioned in Matthew and Mark and Luke, and he adds it this way, that as they came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes, here's what we see. Luke adds, which is opposite Galilee, and it is opposite the side from Galilee, which runs down the western side of the lake. You can see it in that picture. And Luke and Mark say that it was the country of the Gerasenes. Matthew says it was the country of the Gadarenes. And that's not difficult to understand because, in fact, it's both. And let me explain that a little bit. There was, uh, um, as you can, you can study and find out, a little town off the shore called Ger Gerasa. And it was sometimes pronounced Gergasa. But it's, it, it's this town, this small little town, that they came to. And it was in the region of the Gerasenes, or in the greater area of the, Gad of the Gadarenes, or Gadara. And so this is the place where all of this happens, in Gentile territory, that's key, on the other side of the sea. And as we find in, in, immediately in verse 2, what do they meet? And here's the person that we've come to meet today in this cosmic confrontation. Verse 2, And when they had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, we found out, that he couldn't be bound anymore, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched those apart and broke them, and no one could subdue him anymore. And listen to what he, how he spent his time. Night and day, he was crying out in torture and in pain and in uh, turmoil because of these demons and, and causing himself physical harm. So when Jesus gets out of the boat, this is who he meets immediately. And we'll, we'll see this a little bit further. We don't have a lot of time this morning to dig deep into the subject of demons. But I believe that it is true that this subject of demons and demon possession has always seemed somewhat remote and academic to us sophisticated Christians, so to speak, in the 20th century. But society's fascination with demons is clearly evident if we just take a quick survey through our, our TV shows, movies, books, it's evident that the forces of darkness, of the supernatural realm, the demonic realm, fascinates humanity. Bible-believing Christians have always accepted the fact that demons and their activity in the New Testament times, but most of us are inclined to relegate demonic activity in these days to pagan lands far away and to missionary experiences. But it's true that we, as we read in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12, that what we battle against is, against is not flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces. And this is evident today in our miracle that we're looking at here in, in Mark. Listen to what C.S. Lewis uh, writes as he aptly puts, it, puts us in the right perspective. For us as Christians... There are two extremes which we, must not, which we must avoid with reference to satanic or demonic activity. And C.S. Lewis writes, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors, he writes, and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. The confrontation between the powers of heaven and hell are nowhere better seen than in this account of Mark, the account of the Gerasene demonic with our Lord Jesus Christ. One commentator wrote that if this is not the most interesting incident in the life of our Lord, it is certainly one of the most interesting of his entire life. And it is so compelling, so riveting, so bizarre, so strange, and so fascinating that merely just reading the, par the, the miracle sets your mind in the right place to learn all about it. And as we, as we discovered, Mark takes most time of the other writers to look into this cosmic confrontation. So we're going to get a little bit deeper as well. So having spent the night on the lake, you can picture this, delayed and taken off course by this storm, they arrived on the shore. Now, remember... 
They've had a busy itinerary with Jesus as he, as he performed miracles, as he taught in parables, as they went from house to house, as he taught on the busy seaside in Galilee, and now they come across, and they are tired. They are most definitely wet. Their clothes are not of the, of the, of the, the, the textures and materials that we would go out into the, onto the lake with these days, and they're probably cold. And so here they are, and they meet this man, and verse 3 says, here's this guy who had lived and was living among the tombs. That is a really odd place to be living. But that's where he was. Because no one could bind him anymore, he found his place outside of the town, outside of the area we just described, and he was on his own in torment and in uh, a state like we would never even understand. But important for us, notice the picture on the, on the screen as well, is that in those days, cemeteries were not like what we have today with nice, nice rows of... Um, in, in open air of tombstones, the demonic would have dwelt in caves, caves like these probably, nestled between um, perhaps stone coffins, a really eerie and dark and dark place to be. I don't know even how else to put it. But think about this. Picture in your mind the condition of this man. Maybe the other, the other demonic is kind of off to the side, but this one that comes up with ferocious power and full intention would have physically been um, something that we would have never seen, mentally in a, in a very terrible state, emotionally unstable, and I think it would have been abs he would have absolutely been repulsive, and let's be honest, terrifyingly uncomfortable to be in his presence. Luke tells us that he wasn't wearing any clothes. So here's this man that had not only had been crying out night and day, but had been cutting himself. He would have had sores and festers and infections on his body. And he sees Jesus and he comes to him instantly. This is the man that we are, that we are dealing with this morning in this miracle, the madman. We move on a little bit further into verse 6 and it says this, and this is where we see the confrontation take its full Im impact into this miracle and our first reaction to deity. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. Do you notice that? And when he saw Jesus, his reaction or the reaction of the demons to deity was to come and fall down at Jesus' feet. Not in worship, likely in homage, but not in worship. It's not difficult to imagine what was going through the minds of the disciples. Put yourself in their shoes. We've just talked about where they've come from, how they're feeling, physically, emotionally, Mentally, they're probably hungry, and their ship lands, and these two demon-possessed men rush them. They haven't even hardly stepped out of the boat. It was like being attacked, if you watch the Mar Marvel movies, by, by two creatures out of one of those, those scenes of, um, of uh, any one of the movies that would come to your mind. They would probably have thought to pick something up, maybe a piece of driftwood or a rock, or get back in the boat and get back to the other side. Perhaps they were so startled they didn't even know if they could move. So must have been the response of these men. I think it would have been my response. But from all the gospel accounts, I get the distinct impression, as we've just read, that this man was fixed and riveted on Jesus. And his question tells us and leads us to that. He didn't appear to rush upon the small group, which would have been his, his uh, mode of operation before, but he was fixed and on Jesus and pleaded with Jesus. And so, though this legion bowed before Jesus in verse 6, it was no act of worship. He seemed to view Jesus' approach as launching a direct attack on the demonic forces. And then we see this in, in the verse, in his question, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? What a fascinating, unexpected, and interesting uh, statement and question. The people that Jesus had been teaching on the other side of the sea didn't recognize him or admit to him that he was the son of the Most High God. In fact, they denied it and, and caused Jesus to appoint to be, have to teach him parables. But this one, possessed with all of these demons, his name was Legion, as you would remember as Jesus asked him what his name is, and on Roman Legion 
uh, was in around 6,000 soldiers broken into other uh, battalions and garrisons. But that speaks to us that there was a lot of them. The number's not known for sure, but there was a lot of demons in this man. And so he pleaded with Jesus not to be tormented. How ironic is that as well? He seemed to view Jesus' approach as launching this direct attack and asked not to be tormented. The tormentor pleads not to be tormented. And so we see this cosmic confrontation happen. And what it makes me realize as I read this over and over again and had the, the privilege of doing some study on it is that Jesus does have the power. He has power over nature. We saw that in the previ previous miracle at the sea. He has power to heal people of physical ailments, restore sight, restore a man's withered hand. He has the power to trans transform people's lives. He demonstrated that again and again and again. And he can overcome everything. The curse. He can overcome the curse in terms of nature. He can overcome the curse in terms of illness and disease. And he can even raise the dead. This miracle working Messiah is the only one who has life transforming power. And notice the demon, the demonic's question, verse 7, that we just said. What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? These words, most high God, were used frequently in the Old Testament and often by Gentiles to refer to the superiority of the one true God of Israel over and against all other gods. He, was, he is above all. He is the one true God. And then we move quickly into verse 11, and we see the, his request um, to not be tormented, getting a little bit more uh, detailed and, and with more uh, actions involved and what can actually be done. And verse 11 we see, Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. Okay, we could, uh, we could picture that. This, this picture that I put up on the screen is actually a hillside on the side of the sea where they, uh, very close to where they went. And this could have very likely been the area that these pigs rushed down. And they begged him saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So, listen to these words, He gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned. Now, can you picture that scene? This miracle is full of epic scenes. The storm on the sea. The confrontation with this demonic as soon as they set foot on the other side. And now, 2,000 pigs racing off this, this steep incline into the sea. So why the swine? Why the pigs? What's the big deal? And these, as I did a little study, are not just the type of pigs that we're used to in our domesticated farming lifestyle. These were more of a black boar that they would have raised for various reasons on this side of the Sea of Galilee. The Jewish audience, of course, would have understood why pigs. In their culture, Jews would not be, be pig farmers. Um, maybe some of the Hellenistic uh, Jews might have for, for monetary gain, but not in a common sense. And they would have understood that pigs were unclean. They were not kosher. They were to be avoided. But the Gentile audience that Jesus is, is um, encountering and confronting here in this miracle, this was very impactful. These pigs represented a couple of things for them. First and foremost, it would have represented a significant economical loss to have these 2,000 pigs head to their death in, in the sea. They used them for sacrificing to the god, god, to the god Zeus um, in, their, in their pagan culture. They also used them to supply food for the 10th Roman legion that occupied that area. But more critical is that it was an important sacrifice to their gods to atone for sin. So it's interesting that we would see then that Jesus, even in this section of the miracle, is communicating something very important. That life and supernatural power is not in pigs or monetary wealth or gain, but salvation is only in Jesus Christ. And he's showing that this man, created in the image of God, is far more important than the thousands and thousands of dollars that was just lost in these pigs. But as we pass from this section and move into our takeaways here very shortly, 
we must not let us end this uh, part on the death of the pigs, but on the deliverance of the demonic. Think back to Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead, but God made us alive. Five things to note about this man. Where he had been a slave, he was now delivered from demon possession. Where he was once wild and uncontrollable, he was sitting quietly at the feet of Jesus. When he was once an instrument of satanic opposition against the Messiah, now he was a witness to his power, to Jesus' power. Once naked, he was now clothed. And once a menace, menace to society, I'm sure these people in, in Gergersa and Gardera and this region were glad for him to be living where he was. But once a menace to society, now a menace to deliverance and healing. We look at verses 14 to 17 and then 18 to 20 as we lead into our takeaways on this cosmic confrontation. We see two more reactions to deity. The reaction of the, of the herdsmen and the people from the town that came out and the reaction, the second reaction, to this man now healed. In verse 17, Mark writes, And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. That's not usually the case when Jesus performed miracles, was it? Usually, as Randy told us in, in the miracle that he covered last week, people would come in, in throngs to see this. These men dug a hole through a roof to lower their friend down in to have Jesus heal him. And more people would come. Jesus had to depart out into a boat to get some space. But in this case, in this Gentile territory, they begged him to depart. What is true in Scripture is that when we are confronted with the truth of God's word, and with an encounter with the Son of God, a response is always demanded and is inescapable. We must make a choice. A quick look back at verse 13, we see that this loss of 2,000 pigs and this once demon-possessed man now, now controlled and, and clothed and in his right mind um, was, we can understand, f frightful for these people. We can understand their request and their fear having seen this. I don't think they woke up that morning expecting to meet the very Son of God, see this man who had been terrorizing this area for who knows how long, um, changed and clothed and in his right mind, and then having lost 2,000 pigs. Who wakes up thinking that? I'm certain not these people. No one expected that. But here's what, the, what it might have cost them. I'm no pig farmer. But a little research on Google, uh, found, I found out that this could have easily been, in our dollars today, $500,000 to $750,000 worth of livestock lost. So we can understand why they would beg him, I guess, to depart from their region. So their reaction to deity is fear and rejection. Let's move on now to, to, as we close off and get a little closer to our, our takeaways this morning to the next response, the second response of this man healed of these demons. Verse 18. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. Totally different response than the, the townsfolk, the herdsmen. This man's desire was to be with the one who dramatically transformed his life. And that was his response to deity. His response was gratitude and service for what he had experienced. Verse 19 reads, and gives us Jesus' response to this man, and he did not permit him, but said to him, go home and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. I find this section really interesting when looking at Mark and Luke in this uh, commission, you could say, of Jesus to this man. And Jesus in, in Mark uses the word kyrios, or for Lord, supreme authority and master. He says, go and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Luke, on the next slide, we see uses a different word. He uses the word theos, or God. Go and tell them, declare to them, Luke actually says, how much God has done for you and how he has shown mercy on you. Kyrios, supreme master, authority, theos, God, supreme divinity, God the Father. Return to your home and declare how much God has done to you. Follow with me here. So Mark using Kyrios, 
Luke using theos as we come to the close of this miracle. And then we have the response and the obedient response of this healed man where he says, in ver- where we find in verse 20, and he went away and bro- began to proclaim in the Decapolis, this 10 city region of this Gentile area, how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. A very common theme in the miracles of our miracle working Messiah. The marveling and amazement of the people who have behold, beheld the life changing power of Jesus. And so we hear, see here that Mark using Kyrios for Lord, Luke using Theos for God, and now this man uh, going and telling how much Jesus had done for him was in fact declaring, as maybe one of the first missionaries to this Gentile area, with, with quite a story that the one who had healed him, who had released him, was in fact God. Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of the Most High God. I wonder if this man not only experienced supernatural healing, but also physical healing. Now clothed, Luke tells us he was sitting at Jesus' feet, which indicates a position of of, uh, student to teacher, or student to rabbi in that culture, within his right mind, if he also hadn't experienced physical healing. I'm sure he must have. Let's look at two takeaways as we ask the question in closing to the the question of our big idea. What is your response to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ? Thinking of our definition of the gospel in 25 words that Randy often reminds us of. I would challenge you this morning that there is no true freedom as this man um, exemplifies and experiences in his life apart from Jesus Christ, the creator and redeemer of man. Verse 3 again said that he lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched them apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. This last section is important. No one had strength to subdue him. No one until he had a cosmic confrontation with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Romans 5, 6-8 reads, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely will one die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Christ's compassion on people was for their soul, that they would have a right relationship with his Father. And so this tells us and leads us to that one thing I said at the beginning, that this uh, miracle ended in an evangelistic outreach or, or result of this amazing confrontation on the sea, on the side of the Sea of Galilee. And as we close, one more takeaway, and that is fulfillment to measure up, to be satisfied. And as I said about freedom, I say the same thing about fulfillment. There is no true fulfillment apart from Jesus Christ, the creator and redeemer of man. Think about what this healed, demon-possessed man must have felt as far as freedom and fulfillment. You too can have that experience through Jesus Christ in trusting him as your savior in being redeemed and being uh, made new as, as 1, Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians tells us. So as we close, may you and I respond positively and humbly to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ with the desire, the passion, and the en- energy that resulted in the transforma- transformation of this madman. And as a result, my prayer for myself and for you all this, this coming week is that the the Spirit of God may be so evident in us that those around us will see God in our lives, that that we would reflect and refract the glory and image of God this week. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week. And I trust that this miracle has been an encouragement and a challenge to you. And take a look deeper into it this week. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this um, incredible, bizarre, riveting incident in the book of Matthew, book of Mark, sorry, 
where Jesus, in this miracle, transforms a man so far on the other side of your kingdom that we would, we've never met anybody like this. Naked, uh, sores, abused, crying out day and night, tormented like nothing else. But when he met your son, Jesus Christ, the life-transforming redeemer and creator, he was changed forever. This too can be the same for us, Father, spiritually. For those in, 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 our, in our church family that may not know Jesus as their Savior, he presents with them life-changing power forever. To be reconciled, to be made new, to be given your righteousness through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross and his powerful resurrection over the dead. And for us that know you as Savior, Father, this for us is a challenge to do what that man did, to go out and tell our friends, to tell everybody what Jesus has done for us and the mercy that has been shown to us. May that be um, refreshed and revigorated in our lives this coming week. In Jesus' name we pray, giving thanks. Amen.